Hello there, this is uh, Stowe Boyd on the other hand here from Work Talk Research, and I'm Gerd Leonhardt, futurist and uh, CEO of the Futures Agency. Today with a webinar, I'm very happy to have Stowe with me. Our webinar is going to be on social television and the future of television in general. And uh, the format of this webinar is very interactive, so we're looking to talk a little bit less as uh, than usual. Um, and let me go to full screen here so you can actually see my beautiful uh, slides here. Um, if you want to follow us, it's G. Leonhardt for my main feed and at Stowe Boyd. And of course, the website will be all in the email you're going to get sometime from uh, tomorrow from us, but uh, thefuturesagency.com and, and uh, Stowe is at stowboyd.com, right Stowe? And WorkTalk is worktalk.ly. Okay, work cool. Talk. All right. So uh, what we're going to do here is basically do a short presentation. Uh, Stowe will go first. Uh, we'll be taking questions throughout. Um, none of you at this point is activated on the microphone, but we can do that. So if you want to talk, you can use the control panel. There's a control panel, hopefully, that you have up on your screen. You can use that to ask questions anytime, and I'll be working it back and forth. And I will also activate individually. Uh, people who want to talk and ask questions. But if you do want to talk, make sure you use a microphone or a headset uh, and, and hopefully not um, not your iPad in a, in a taxi in Los Angeles. Um, so <laughs> welcome to the webinar. Uh, I'm going to change the presentation and uh, I'll make a brief introduction about what I do, uh, just in case you, uh, you've, you haven't actually noticed. And uh, Stowe will do a short presentation, a short introduction on his own uh, past and what he does. So I'm going to go to full screen on Stowe. Um, whoops, sorry. I can't actually do that because I have to see the control. So we're still playing with the system, as you can see a little bit. Uh, can you, Stowe, can you see the slide okay here? Is it, is it okay? Yes. Yep, that's Hold on just, end, yeah. just one second here. Make sure we actually have it. Okay, there's another drawback here of, of the system. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. We're experimenting here with how we should present this. But is this good now? Looks good. Okay. All right. Over to Stowe. And uh, again, welcome to the webinar. Use the question box. And if, you, uh, if you're having questions about PDFs and stuff that we're using in here, everything is going to be in the email tomorrow, including these slides and everything. So uh, we don't want to spend too much more time on the practicality. So over to Stowe. So the, uh, the backdrop of everything we're going to talk about today is, is really um, something we're not going to talk about explicitly, but it's important to touch upon it uh, at least for a moment, and that is we've seen the rise of the social web as an amazingly transformative uh, uh, set of innovations, and uh, in, in some ways completely un unexpected. Uh, you know, years ago, I think, if you asked people what was going to be the most important thing coming out of the rise of the Internet, most people a decade ago would not have said uh, the, the social thing. They would have talked about e-commerce or uh, you know, better connecting business processes or cross companies and so on. And to some extent that is true. All those things have happened as well. But the social web has been an astonishing thing. Um, <clears throat> perhaps, as I say, the most important, unprecedented um, and unexpected thing uh, that humanity has done in the last you know, 200 years. Um, and of course, that's having a big impact on everything it touches. And so, in particular, the rise of of, of social television, and uh, you know, a, a range of other things. We're going to talk about the second screen, which is a primary aspect of this. And I'm going to ask Gerd to jump ahead and, and skip over my background or slide, Gerd, because people can look at that when we send out the deck. But I'm a really well-known guy doing a lot of stuff in the world of social tools, and that's my research area. But we will send you more information about that later, so you can jump right to the next slide. Well, needless to say, though, if people haven't heard about you, they've lived under a rock. So <laughs> <laughs> here you are. Here's the next slide. Well, the, the, the thing that underscores all of this, I think, is this great quote by Kevin Kelly, that the thinking about the economics of the new environment we're operating in is that the imperative of that, a, a, a central imperative is that uh, you know, everything that is going to become meaningful to us or increase in meaningfulness to us is going to amplify relationships. And that is exactly what we're seeing in television. Um, you're seeing this really amazing phenomenon where entertainment people who years ago might have been very risk averse to using things like blogging and so on 
with the rise of the new technologies today, particularly based around tablets and, and uh, mobile devices, they are in anticipating a one-to-one -one relationship with every person out there who is, you know, as they say, consuming their content. From my viewpoint, I just think of it as TV use, that we're using the television now like a, a device that has apps on it, and we are now having this connection to, uh, you know, the, the, the studios, the producers, the directors, the writers of these, these art forms in a way that, was unpre that is totally unprecedented. And so <clears throat> the biggest change, next slide, Gerd, the biggest change is this transition uh, of what we think about television. So television can be thought of as, you know, a spectrum of electromagnetic ra radiation, the way the scientists might think about it. Uh, you can think about it as a medium of communication, the way that, you know, McLuhan thought about it back in the 60s. We often just think of television as like the kinds of entertainment we're seeing, but the thing that's really happening now that's most important and central to our discussion today, it's, as I put it here, another corner of human civilization that is being pulled into the black hole of the web. And just as the web has changed all the other media that it's come in contact with, like print journalism and so on, it is radically changing the way that television is created, the way it's distributed, the way it's part, the term they use consumed, I hate it. I don't like to talk about consumption of, of media. But the way that users are going to use television is already changing dramatically. And that's, that's the central thesis of my talk today, which I'm going to race through because I want to get interactive, as Gerd said. Next okay, slide, uh, just a quick input, uh, a, few more, a few more new people in here. If you want to ask questions, please use the question box uh, and type away. I'll be monitoring this throughout, and then we can assign the audio uh, to individuals later on as well. Go on, Stowe. Next slide, please. <laughs> so, basically, I characterize this as a transition from old television, you know, the dumb box in the corner connected to a cable box or a, a, a satellite dish, but now it's coming in contact with the internet and everything's changing very fast and we're going to new TV. And so the next slide, uh, Gerd, shows what old TV was like. And the standalone television, the dumb box, it was a broadcast model where they would, you know, send out the, uh, you know, the, the, the old appointment television model where you'd watch the show at nine. Um, very centralized monopolies. I mean, we're still seeing a lot of those things uh, very much in place. The, the fact that I can't, you know, watch a single NBA game or just rent, you know, Game of Thrones from HBO um, is, is a telling uh, problem and is going to be one of the biggest hurdles. And I'm, I know it's one of the things that people want to talk about uh, because of some of the new news that's coming out. For example, um, HBO is experimenting now in Scandinavian countries with an over-the-top, unbundled, version of HBO. Um, and that's got creating a lot of uh, tongue wagging. And we will talk later about why it is that things like that might happen and, and when. Um, but this is a, a, a mechanism that is based on scarcity economics and is very content centric. But the new TV is just starting, all right? It's still new days. And, and in fact, we're actually seeing it in the order of more or less that we're looking at here. First of all, we're seeing this swarm of devices. It's not just a dumb TV in the corner. People are watching television with all their devices on at the same time. They have the tablet. They have their uh, mobile phone. It was a study um, done <laughs> by Ericsson quite recently that shows worldwide now over 50 percent of users are accessing social media while watching television, while watching the dumb TV in the corner, but they're connected with their tablet or their phone to various social media tools. Um, and the number in the United States is much higher. It's above 70% of Americans are now watching, as they watch television, they have multiple devices on. And this, the reason that people are doing it is it's very social and participatory. And these other things are going to trickle through and change the way, the complexion of this industry at a, at a fundamental uh, business level. We're going to talk about those in the next few slides. Obviously, the swarm of devices, the next slide, <coughs> is, um, you know, increasingly being driven by the, the adoption of smartphones and now tablets. Um, as I said earlier, 
the majority, overwhelming majority of Americans are now doing this. Um, <laughs> and they're also doing things, um, a combination of things. They're looking things up. Yes, they're doing searches to find out more information. But they're also using specialized apps, which is sort of the interesting, most interesting thing, and the growth of these new apps that are designed to run on the second screen that provide an amplified experience for people. Um, and they have all kinds of fascinating capabilities like uh, audio fingerprinting where you can turn on your, your, uh, your Shazam on your, on your iPhone, hold it up to the TV and then Shazam knows what television show you're watching and then you can share that information with other friends so they can watch the same show with you and you can chat about the NBA game or whatever it is. Um, and so you can actually synchronize your watching and become very social through that. But it also could be a really interesting experience for new advertising. Um, the possibility for someone, <clears throat> an advertiser, <coughs> to provide you an ad about those Nike sneakers that that basketball player is wearing. Um, if you're that sort of person, they could know uh, something about your past uh, viewing preferences and know that you're interested in sneakers and then give you real-time uh, additional information about those sneakers up to and including the possibility of buying them while you're watching the show. So we're seeing a, a whole bunch of opportunities here um, and some of them are actually very radical and I'm going to revisit one of those later. The, the, the end run, as I, I've called it in the report that uh, I wrote earlier this year on uh, this topic on social television and the second screen, um, <clears throat> but I'm going to hold that for the my last comment at the very end. Uh, Sto, um, Sto, do you hear me? Sto? Yep. Yeah, it strikes me that, that this is really no longer television uh, by definition, really, right? Because, you know, if you look at the original def definition of television, it, it is it is a one-way thing, right? And we watch and, and that's it, right? It's broadcasting, right? right? And so I call, I call this broadbanding. Uh, and I think we have this convergence of broad broadcasting and broadbanding, uh, which which will completely implode the business model of uh, a one way thing. I I don't know what you're thinking about this, but if it's a swarm of devices, we're not going to have the same guys own that part of the food chain, right? Well, and that's that's exactly the challenge. Um, you know, who is it that is paying who to sell you that that Nike sneaker? It might not be the NBA. And so, you know, there's, a, there's some really interesting questions about, you know, if, it's, if you're using a device, let's say you're using a, some hypothetical future Amazon device, you know, that provides an a, a integrated experience into Amazon, you know, that meaning the store, the, the, the whole spectrum of things that someone like Amazon offers. <clears throat> Amazon doesn't necessarily have to make a deal with the NBA um, to provide you that sneaker information or the sneaker itself or give them a slice of the revenue. So it yeah. opens up all it, kinds of alternatives that are in, in fact threatening to the sort of established uh, monopolies in, in today's television production world. Yeah, and create so a creative a destruction challenge. really, right? I mean, it's... Well, uh, yeah, it's the, uh, Craigslist, it's the Craigslist alternative for them. You know, what, what Craigslist did to the newspapers, because they unraveled the newspaper's revenue model, um, you know, was devastating. And there was no effective response once people, you know, started to switch over to going to Craigslist for classifieds. And the same thing holds with these people. If they, right. can't, if they can't subsidize their production costs or the cost of, of how much they spend, how much they give to the NBA or how much they give to some production studio to build a series for them, if they can't get that money from the advertising side, then the whole economics of the system you know, fall apart, just like we've seen with print, yep. print uh, uh, media as well. So it's the same kind of challenge. I mean, uh, it's an analogous kind of challenge. Okay, go go to the next slide, huh? Please. Yeah. So of course, the social and participatory. What we're saying is that people can get very involved. They can, <clears throat> they can actually, you know, be tweeting in real time uh, information that gets sort of synthesized into shows in real time. So you know, you could be voting, and the American Idol can respond to that sort of thing in real time. But it also can be a slower kind of interactivity, like people can get involved with the direction that a, 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 a series might be headed in over time. And also, of course, the people doing the production can start to figure out how, in fact, to involve participants into the, into the things that they're doing, not necessarily 
you know, you know, deciding, you know, which which way things fall in a in a drama or something, but getting involved in all kinds of uh, promotional activities, and so it's it's transforming the television production side of things, but it's also providing a mechanism for all sorts of new information to be uh, provided to people because of what's going on. The sentiment analysis of people watching a show, for example, can be surfaced in real time, and that's that sort of thing is 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 just at the really earliest turning point now, the direct social thing we all understand. You know, you're sitting there and you're arguing with your brother about who's going to win the game uh, through text messaging. Now that's being incorporated into specialized apps that might make it easier than using text, um, but it's analogous to things that we already understand. So that part is a little more obvious. The, the way that it's going to trickle through to the way that production takes place is, uh, is, is going to be more unsettling. It's going to be a bigger change. Next. <clears throat> um, distributed marketplaces. So instead of instead of having this centralized model, we're already seeing some people who are capable of doing it defecting from you know the established uh, you know business models of television. So you know Louis CK and other you know really well known performers can just say I'm going to go direct to my public. I'm not going to go through the production studios. I'm not going to be managed through, uh, you know, an HBO or a comedy channel uh, kind of a model. I'm going to go direct and 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 keep my margins myself and be able to develop a, a mechanism where I can go directly to people and 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 have that benefit me without the headaches involved. It turns out that, you know, people like Louis C.K. have shed light on the fact that you know doing a, a special on. Comedy Central doesn't pay very much money for the individual, but it's very good for the channel, but it's not very good for the, the comics. And so going the other way is actually significant be significantly better, and so we're going to see more and more of that happening where people are jumping out. And so there's, there's been some discussions, for example, that Apple might, had, uh, might um, buy the rights to, uh, you know, uh, Premier League uh, soccer or football, as they say, outside of the United States, and that they would take that and distribute that globally if, they, if, if, the, uh, if the league could actually make more money that way, why wouldn't they do it? And so it's just a question of can you, in fact, you know, see the economic uh, you know, lines go in the right direction where all of a sudden it could be beneficial for a, an end run around the uh, centralized, controlled, sort of monopolistic marketplace. And I think that the likelihood is combination of factors are going to make it very attractive in the near term for different companies, different uh, groups like the NBA or Premier League to jump out and, and allow somebody like an Apple or an Amazon or a Google to take them over the top worldwide. And one of those is the, uh, the transition of, of cord cutters and so on. A new study that I, I, I read yesterday actually from Ericsson says that cord cutting went up 7% from 2011 to the present day. And so in perhaps less than a year, we've seen an additional 7% of the population decide to turn off any connection to the cable networks. And so the combination of that and a number of other factors could make it financially advantageous, and so we'll see this distributed marketplace sort of happen, and I, ha I have this feeling it's all going to happen at once, kind of like what we saw with Apple and uh, iTunes breaking the stranglehold of, that the uh, record labels had, and th they started to see the light at the, at the end of the tunnel because they were afraid that, you know, piracy was, you know, was killing them, and they saw that with Apple, they had the opportunity to go back to selling records at least. <laughs> so I think the same thing is likely to happen here. All right, we have a question here from, from Jay Mulraines. Uh, he, he's asking, is the, do you think globally present companies will be the first to benefit from this new distributed marketplace? Uh, I guess he means the incumbent globally, or, or not globally present companies like any global present company, I suppose. Right? What's your thought on that? Um. Well, I think the people that will benefit first from these are the, these large players who could potentially become, you know, the new intermediaries in a over-the-top world, you know, the Apples, Googles, Amazons of the world. And then there's also a, a second tier of, uh, of new software companies who are going to build, you know, better and more interesting software 
to run on the second screen to give us that social dimension or you know better advertising or better information options um, you know out there somewhere there is the Facebook of you know social television to be and it could be it might be Facebook although Facebook has you know been lamentably bad at being mobile so it seems unlikely for them to be that player right away um, but we'll have to wait and see. There's a number of very interesting uh, companies, uh, many of which I reviewed in that report I was talking about earlier, and, and we'll send out the links for that tomorrow so people can download it. Um, but there's a whole bunch of new interesting players. Um, I mentioned Shazam already, but there's a bunch of, you know, uh, Get Glue, for example. There's a whole bunch that are doing very innovative stuff. And certainly some of those companies are going to do very well by becoming, you know, one of the market leaders in this space. Mm -hmm. And that they will relatively quickly become global as a result of that. Although they may be starting in a much more local sense, but they will be, be pushed into global. Great. Let, let's go to the next slide, huh? Yep. So uh, abundance economics. I mean, here's a picture of, you know, the, the million channels that we were offered, you know, years ago when, when people were talking about the brand new internet you know, of television and so on. Well, it really hasn't happened that way. I mean, you know, most people have access to a few hundred channels or something, but it's all locked down in such a way that, you know, you can't get at what you want. The way they're bundling everything and forcing you to buy these packages, you can't get what you want. Um, the natural unit of television is a show or a series, right? The natural unit of watching a sporting event is a, an event, and I don't necessarily... You know, it's artificial to force people to buy 90 channels so that you can get HBO, so that you can see, uh, you know, Game of Thrones, and that's all you're interested in. So we will see this explosion of uh, opportunities as more and more things are, are going to be breaking out and going over the top. And, of course, we'll also see more and more uh, activities like, you know, Netflix building its own series and so on. Now they're bringing back series that have, you know, come off, fallen off uh, conventional television. We'll see more and more of that and, and ultimately that'll be a, a more wonderful experience because we'll have access to a lot of really interesting you know content out there um, that now is too expensive, artificially made too expensive to access. Next slide. And the, the most important thing is we're seeing this transition from a content-centered content universe which is the way that the production companies and the cable companies think about it. They have this content they make and they're holding onto it at every transition point and making it really difficult for people to get at it, except in the way that they want to do things. They want to have you watch it on the TV and they want you to watch the, the commercials and they want to make sure it's locked down and you can't do anything clever with it. But it, it's starting to dribble away. It's, ex, it's escaping and what we're seeing, the, the most important uh, aspect of that is, is this transition to a user-centered television universe where it's all going to be about the user experience, not just, you know, the, the quality of the TV show. It, it's going to be the, the quality of the experience for the individual who is watching television and socializing and pulling up other supplemental information all at the same time. And so the real battle to be fought is on the other device. And so it turns out the most compelling number is that when people have access to other devices and are watching television, more of the, the majority of their time is spent looking at the other device, not the dumb TV. So people's you know, consciousness gets split, right? We, we're time sharing, we're time slicing, and we spend more time looking at the other device than the television set. <laughs> and as a result, that's where the battle is going to be fought. Yes, we still need to have good quality television shows or high quality sporting events or, you know, the brightest minds on Sunday morning television arguing about politics. <laughs> but the thing that will determine who is going to get the most uh, eyeballs, if you will, how much involvement are you going to have with the community of people out there that care about that content, it will be determined not just by what goes on on the dumb device in the corner, it's going to be based on the quality of the whole experience. And that's going to be a very distributed thing because there's going to be many different players and they're not necessarily going to be all orchestrated tightly, um, <clears throat> but there's going to be a real radical shift in how we think about what's going on as a result. Next. Okay, so there's an answer. I, I bumped over to you. A, a question, I mean. <laughs> 
Look, look. Well, how do you build a? <laughs> yeah, how do you build, how do you build a, brand? a brand and content awareness in this new digital world? Well, it, I think it depends on who you are. I mean, um, somebody like a Louis C.K. has a brand and is able to craft a new way to interact with his community of of followers, if you will. Um, somebody like a, an Amazon, you know, has a brand and is going to be able to exploit it. Um, if you're a if you're an, a, a production house, you know, building a show and trying to get a series out, there's a whole lot of alternatives today. Um, there are other channels that, that you can use to get through to people who want to see your, your uh, might want to see the, 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 the content that you're creating. You don't necessarily have to go through HBO or, you know, uh, Fox Channel or whatever. Um, so there's just a, more and more options. Um, and then I think the more, more interesting is, you know, the, the branding of television experience is going to be different because uh, people will take advantage of this new participatory side of television and that opens up a whole new dimension, if you will, of competition um, in the sort of the content side of it. Okay, there's another question that relates to this uh, from uh, from Jamal Reigns. Thanks for asking the question, Jamal. By the way, anyone who's out there, uh, right now you're obviously muted on the microphone, but if you want to speak, just send a quick message and I'll unmute you. But please only if you have a headset. The question from Jamal says, why do you think that Apple has been the go-to incumbent when it comes to content creators allowing their content to be distributed with this new shift? Uh, I'll take a crack at this real quick, uh, Stone, and I'll bump it back to oh, you. Please. Um Basically, I think Apple has played a fantastic game of um, making the content owners, like record labels to start with, but also now movie companies, believe that there is a way to have a global distribution system, but charge more and keep more control than before. Uh, <laughs> so this is basically, uh, they, they've succeeded in playing this uh, role of uh, you know changing it, but, but without scaring them. And looking like a really safe way, like in music, you know, clearly uh, iTunes music sales are not increasing very much, and and it's it, it's a solution for two percent of the population, but it has worked, and 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 it's so safe and locked up and secure and and walled that everybody feels really comfortable. But in the end, in my view, it's not a real solution uh, to the large scale of consumers around the world. Well, I think that's true. I mean, if you look at it demographically, there's no doubt about it. If you look at teenagers, you know, they're they're wandering around listening to YouTube music all the time, right? Yeah. So they don't they don't necessarily ever quote unquote buy that song. You know, they simply every time they want to hear it, they go to YouTube or they're listening to Spotify or something. But actually, you know, young kids, the, the real young kids are doing stuff through YouTube, and it's it's kind of fascinating to see that as an alternative. And and you know. They're amazingly adroit at being able to like get back to the particular thing on YouTube using YouTube search. I mean, you um, know, this is this is really kind of annoying when you think about. It. I mean, I'm a total Apple fan. I buy everything they do. I love their stuff, right? But when you think about the policy of what we can do with the content there, it's appalling, right? I mean, it's well, like yeah. you ha you have to be mad to play the game, and I do. I I I rent movies there, and then they expire after twenty four hours, and I haven't watched it, and I pay again. I mean, how's, <laughs> well, how's... you have thirty days. You have thirty <laughs> days to watch, but once you start, yeah, there's that yeah, crazy yeah, thing. Yeah, I mean, how crazy can you be? I mean, you've got to be stupid really to do that. But I do it, and and uh, because it's it's quality and so on. But still, you know, um, here's a related question from Gerhard Rettenegger. Um, thanks for the question, Gerhard. Uh, he's, he's asking, which role will play traditional TV enterprises like the BBC or CNN or ORF in Austria in this future of television you just described? Well, I think, you know, there you've picked sort of, you know, the, one of the most conservative edges of, of this, you know, this, this, sw this swarm of, of things that are happening and moving slowly, you know, over in one direction. Um, and they're going to be some of the slowest um, simply because... You know, especially the BBC, we less so here in the United States where we have PBS, but it's not as well subsidized, to say the least. Um, uh, it, you know, it's going to be, you know, they're going to they're going to move at some some pace based on their perceived need to do so, rather than, um, you know, some entrepreneurial frenzy of of activity like we're seeing in the startups and the second screen. But you know, it's certainly the case. You can imagine them having, you know, innovative new. Uh, attempts at figuring out how to interact more more 
you know, in a rich way with, you know, the, the greater community of people. I, I just think it's not the place that you're going to see, you know, the, the most rapid innovation, which honestly is going to come from, from my viewpoint, is going to come from some combination of, you know, some very clever person it, it will wind up, let's say, being in charge of uh, Time Warner, for example, and some forward thinking guy will make some kind of a pact with Amazon to, and attempt to try to, you know, become the dominant player in the space in some clever way. And we'll see some really large scale innovative things. But I think in, in this case, you're going to see it sort of as, as I said, a sort of two phase thing that real big players will innovate. Some will come through with some new breakthrough kind of notion of how the platform should work. And it would allow people to be able to write applications in a smart way. So, for example, imagine if there was a stream of information that came out of a show, uh, sort of a, a, a data stream that ran in parallel with the show. And that data stream included all kinds of information that would make it easy for people to build apps and amplify the user's experience. So, for example, when a, a, new, uh, a new actor walks into a scene on the TV, the data stream would have the actor's name and a, a collection of information that would allow you to pull information out of a database to put it up on the on the second screen. So you could look in that column on your second screen app and see who that, that actor is who just walked on stage and said something. So if you did that, then there would be this clever way for people to build apps uh, because you'd be publishing a whole bunch of information about the what's going on in the show. And so the people that figure that problem out and figure out how to do it and figure out how to monetize it and make new money out of it and share revenue opportunities to people. Like we will give you this information about which Nike sneaker that is if you give us some of the money back for the ads that you're going to show on your second screen app. It sounds like so a the clever people story. that dream something like that up will have this big breakthrough and they'll create a new ecosystem of, of apps that could do wild things. I just don't expect that to come from something like public broadcasting or, or uh, the BBC because it's going to be driven by the desire to get in on this new gold rush, you know, this new new source of advertising revenue. Hey, Sto? Yes, okay, I'm here. I, I'm here. Sorry, <laughs> I had it on mute here for a sec. I'm going to ask a question, uh, answer the question real quick, and then we'll move on. We have two more questions here. Uh, okay. I would uh, split it up into two things. You know, public television, in my view, has a fantastic future in, in this uh, in this new future of television. But they have to get out of there thinking that they have a, a, a monopoly on attention because they get paid by taxes. You know, they, um, the BBC is doing an amazing job, in my view, in, in many of the things that they do. And it's, it's of course, you know, because it's, uh, it's you know, UK rather than, say, France or Germany or Switzerland, uh, where that is part of the DNA, you know. But, but the big incumbents like ABC or CNN, in my view, I think there, there's going to be a lot of innovation that will happen outside of them and being totally impacting them in a very, very short time. Very much like the record labels have not invented Spotify. They do own a piece of Spotify now. But they didn't invent it, and of course they couldn't because of antitrust. But um, in my view, I think that public TV has a huge opportunity here also to justify the fact that we're paying with our taxes. Um, but, you know, the, the embrace, embracing of technology and this whole groundswell of people producing and, and connecting and having several devices and stuff, I will show my own presentation, I think represents a huge opportunity for that uh, to put new meaning into public broadcasting. Um, let's move on to this other question here by Wes Madlock. Uh, do you know if the content providers have much to say in how a viewer views the content or is this the service providers? Using your Apple 30 days to view it, but only 24 hours once you start. What is the question? Yes. Well, uh, of course, the the content owners, the rights owners, stipulate that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's basically Apple fighting for better rules, I think, for their users. But uh, this is obviously not a high priority rather than to sell their stuff. That's how I look at it. But it's, you know, it's sort of like better than nothing kind of thing. You know? I don't right, know. Right. And I... I I think that end of the spectrum is also the sort of most conservative, most traditional kind of, of, of usage model, which is you're renting uh, a single thing, you know, this one show, and it's basically like a DVR, and you have to watch it because your you know, DVR is going to erase it in some period of time. Um, but the, it's the, the whole question of rent versus ownership and what ownership actually means even. I mean, the, 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 the news story this week was 
I'm not sure if it's true. It, it seems maybe it's a spoof. But Bruce Willis was ostensibly going to sue um, the, uh, Apple because he wants to bequeath his iTunes to his children. So, uh, and, and of course, it's against the, the, the regulations of your agreement with Apple. That means they expire when you pass away. You don't actually own them in the sense of like owning a hardcover book in your, in your bookcase. And so the, the question of what is it that you really, what your rights are as a, as, as a subscriber to these services is really kind of murky. And well, it kind of it kind of seems to me now, and this is really annoying I, as far as the rights is concerned, is that a lot of major content providers are thinking that on the internet they can get they can give us less rights than before, and they can charge more for it, uh, and yep. then be, and then be better off in the long run. And of course, that's not going to happen. Uh, this ties into the next question with, from Patricia Mullis, uh, with young viewers spoiled with good quality free content. Will premium content models die? What are other monetization streams apart from advertising? I believe people will pay for what has value and meaning and relevance. And, and I think that's true whether it's a car or a TV show or a band or an author. Uh, if we figure that out, they will pay for, for a high quality content. Uh, they are going to be much more demanding and they are much more demanding. And I think if we want to sell stuff, um, I have a slide showing this later. My view is that we have to do a pay will, not a pay wall. So we we can't force them to pay. We have to attract them to pay. Um, well, at least in the states, uh, you know, our, our transition has gone far enough ahead now that the great majority of people aren't getting free anything. And most people in America uh, who watch television are getting it through a cable box, and so they're paying. It's not free, and the typical fee in the U.S. I think is something like sixty or seventy dollars a month um, in order to get you know the cable and the basic services, and then everything on top of that is a la carte because you have, you, know, you want to buy a package that gives you uh, ESPN that's going to cost you another you know chunk of change every month. Um, well, yes, yeah, I, I think we agree with this. Yeah, I th we agree on this though. I think it's basically piracy. To me, it's just unmet demand. It's not that people are evil or don't want to pay. And of course, this opens up a huge can of worms here. Maybe we shouldn't go there. But right, uh, no, no. And the thing you you uh, said before about quality, uh, you know, that uh, the, the Ericsson study that came out this week, uh, you know, people are forty percent of people are willing to pay more for HD. For example, if they have a big HD TV, they want a higher quality image up there. Um, and they yeah. are willing to pay for that. And so, the other thing is, of course, you know, that if you take a deal like Netflix, which we don't really get anywhere but the U.S. or, or maybe I think Brazil or so, right? Uh, that kind of deal is basically you just pay to be part of it and, and it doesn't matter how much you watch because there's no damage to watching. And that right. model could scale to a billion people. Just imagine that, right? Uh, yeah, it's an all you can eat now. And, and and this kind of model will take off uh, around the world once this uh, this stumbling block is removed of uh, who is allowed to do this. I think right. so. Was was the last that was your last slide just a minute ago, right? Was okay. It was yes. Okay. Yes. So um, I'm going to go to. Um, Okay, yeah. one more question from Drew Chandler. Again, if you want to speak audio, uh, just let us know uh, and we'll, we'll activate you and uh, we'll, we'll hear to what you have to say. Um, Drew Chandler is asking, at what point, if ever, will content providers be able to dictate more consumer-friendly terms to content owners? Uh, this is a very good question. You mean like a platform owner will be able to dictate more content? From yes, well, I think that point is coming very, very quickly. Because, I mean, what else are you going to do? I mean, look at Spotify. Uh, just as an example, you know, I'm, a, I'm an avid Spotify user, and it's not video, but it's sort of a good example. Um, yes. You know, 32 million users and 4 million subscribers uh, is not growing fast enough. A lot of people want to pull their content out because they say there isn't enough money. But if we had done the same thing with, with radio, for example, we wouldn't have radio today. You have to have a large model that appeals to 99% of the population. And I think content providers and rights holders are starting to understand that they have this elitist models like iTunes, which, you know, because I'm an elite in parenthesis, I like, right? But it just doesn't make sense for the global population. So uh, that point is coming very, very soon because you can only ignore the consumers for that long. Right. And I think you're exactly, you're, you're dead on. Listen, looking at what's happening with music is the best pre-sentiment of what the same kind of sort of erosion of the, the conventional model. So the example again that I point at is how kids get their music from YouTube, which costs them nothing. 
And so if if Google figures out a way, and they, they obviously are because they're selling ads, they're monetizing um, you know, the access to all those videos that bands want to have out there so that they can make their money by people going to the, their concerts. So the economics of music have shifted so that, once again, it becomes a user-centric experience model because the whole premise now of where the money gets made is people going to the concerts. Well, it comes down to it comes down to a very simple equation, right? Uh, you either want control or you want money. Uh, it, it, are you going to be able to have both? I very much doubt it. Um, I think also the other question that what came up earlier is like, is the only money in advertising? I believe there's entirely new models coming up in terms of how you monetize content, including bundling, including e-commerce connected to the content, in, including uh, premiums and specials and high definition versions. And, you know, uh, Kevin Kelly talks about this and he calls it the new generatives. Right? I have a slide on that later, but okay. Uh, save your questions. I have to go to full screen now to show my presentation. I'll, I'll go through it fairly quickly, but I can't actually look at the questions at the same time for technical reasons. So uh, maybe maybe Stowe uh, Stow can't see them either. So hold your questions for the next 10 minutes, okay? I'm just going to go through it. And by the way, I've just invented a hashtag. That hashtag is uh, uh, Gerd and Stowe. Hashtag Gerd and Stowe, G-E-R-D and Stowe. Uh, if you want to tweet about this, we should use that for the next time. I'm sure nobody has that hashtag quite yet. Uh, again, uh, put the questions out and, and fire away 10 minutes, and then we'll go to open conversation, okay? So I'm going to go to full screen now because uh, of that stuff, okay? So... Uh, I have used two resources for this talk, and I will send the links around. Uh, the Arison Consumer Lab TV and Video uh, Analysis of Evolving Consumer Habits, fantastic report. And just yesterday, the Google Multiscreen World Report, uh, fantastic stuff. I'll send the links around, but if you Google for this stuff, you'll find them no problem. Or just look at my Twitter feed, uh, G. Leonhard, and then you'll see them. And I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm referring to the stuff. Uh, so uh, can you turn off the mic while we're... While we're uh, if you ask a question, turn it back on. Huh? Okay. Um, I think what we're seeing here, as Thor was saying, you know, there's a, there's a new ecosystem in the making. I call this a social mobile uh, local cloud, the solo mobile cloud and over the top television. But the thing about ecosystem, as you can see on this nice little uh, image here, is that it doesn't work until it's together. So if we if we have an ecosystem and it's running, then it works great. For example, electric cars, if you can't fill them up, when you're going down the highway 100 miles later, then there's no ecosystem. You won't drive one. Uh, and we'll have the same problem with over-the-top and social television content. That has to be connected to a whole ecosystem. I think 2017, five years from now, we're going to have 50% uh, more people on mobile internet and a $250 billion advertising market on mobile devices and, and digital. And that's when we have the whole ecosystem. So the fact that the ecosystem is kind of weak right now, as you can see with Netflix and Hulu and all the, and YouTube, right, doesn't mean it won't exist. Uh, it will, but it's in the making. So my ETA, depending on the territory, is between two, three, five years, but developing countries first. Um, I think this also means that, that it's kind of game over with this idea of living in silos. You know, there's the content guys, there's the tech guys, there's, there's the device guys. Uh, as you can see, you know, Amazon is doing hardware, uh, Google is doing hardware, Yahoo is talking about doing hardware, and HTC is do talking about doing music and software. Right? So game over for the silos. Very important point. I think we're going to see what I call telemedia, which is the convergence of telecom and media, uh, and that is inevitable. And that's going to be a lot of disruption, as Schumpeter says. You know, we're living in a Schumpeterian age now. Uh, um, I uh, listened to an Economist podcast the other day on the audio version of the app, which is cool, talking about how we have this sort of uh, create, creative uh, disruption going on. And this is really what it's all about. Uh, new interfaces. I mean, being able to talk and have it translated. Uh, the Siri control for television. Gesture control. Right, all that stuff that sounds like science fiction, that's going to be huge for the future of television. Imagine that connected to social TV. Uh, that is definitely not television anymore. Right, that's like that's almost like telepathy in a way. <laughs> so, uh, new interfaces just around the bend. Right now, it's still a little bit early, but voice control, yes, gesture control, absolutely. It'll be like Minority Report, pulling up data from the cloud for the average person with a cheap television. Multi-screen futures. Uh, the key word here to me is uh, best screen available. Uh, 
And we see this in the report. I have some examples later uh, about how people are easily switching, you know, watching something on the iPhone, then they get home, then they switch it to the computer, and then they project it to the television. Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff is basically best screen available. And that really makes a huge difference for content producers, also creating uh, what's called uh, cross-media content, right, and transmedia productions, where you're producing on the mobile phone and then using tablets to then switch to television. That, that's going to be absolutely a huge trend also for content creators, opening up a whole new uh, job description of transmedia producer, uh, which we're seeing around the world now. Um, interesting slide here as well. I think the future of TV to me, if in a nutshell, is connecting the crowd with the cloud uh, because all content is moving into the cloud. The crowd is there pretty soon. will be 5 billion connected people. Uh, and they will use all different devices. And that's where, you know, those models come in like Netflix or like Spotify or so. You know, well, let's get 80% of those people connected and there'll be plenty of money in subscriptions, in advertising, in premium, in e-commerce, right? So that's the mission, uh, not to disconnect the crowd from the cloud like many people have been trying to do uh, in many countries like uh, initiatives like SOPA and PIPA and ACTA and all the bizarre uh, other paths that we have around the world. So uh, TechCrunch has an interesting summary of this, that people are using these devices, but they're simultaneously using an other device. So this is the big thing about television. It's still on, but I'm actually diverting my attention somewhere else, uh, regular television, unless, of course, I watch a movie. And this is, of course, a big cultural issue, much more ahead in the US and the UK than in Switzerland, for example. This slide better to download, but basically what it shows here is that we have a significant behavioral and cultural change that's in progress, is that while we watch TV, we're browsing the internet. We talk to others in the room, which is not new, but we're eating, that's also not new, but we're using social forums to discuss stuff, right? And, and so television is just one of those input channels. Um, and I believe that mainstream television and common TV is here to stay, but they're going to have to adapt heavily into how this works, what we're paying, and also the power of the user because we are creating with our comments and our, uh, um, our activities and our ratings, we're creating meta content that becomes worth gold, as you can see with the latest developments with Twitter. Uh, bottom line by Google from their slides, it says TV no longer commands of full attention. I think this is what it comes down to. I don't know what you think about this, though, but uh, I think this really nails it. T television is there. People are watching. People are not disconnecting by and large. Yes, some of them are disconnecting cable, but, you know, they're viewing an other device at the same time. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's a fascinating thing if you look at the, uh, the pattern of use over time when people initially get access to a, a technology, a uh, communications technology like, like radio or, or, or TV in the past, um, people would do it, as they say, rivalrously. That means they would give all of their attention to the radio or the television. And But what happens is, after a while, people get habituated to this thing, and they're able to uh, drive a car and listen to the radio at the same time, for example. Um, and so, uh, you know, the people that are sort of farthest along in this, this, this curve, this transition of splitting, you know, time slicing, uh, on multiple devices are the younger the people are, the more likely they are to, to be doing that and talking at the same time while watching television nominally. And uh, it's exactly one of those generational shifts that drives older people crazy to watch television with younger people because <laughs> yeah, they're, they're <laughs> clicking and typing and texting and talking all at the same time. And the, you know, grandpa wants to watch the show. <laughs> yeah, this is this. Of course, I think it's a whole behavior shift. We're going yeah. into in this. I mean, it's television as we know it is dead for this reason, not because of economic reasons, but because of behavior reasons that we have other things to pay attention to. If you look at the next slide here, right? Uh, just what you said, still right now, the kids are leading once again. If you're looking at these slides, these are from Deloitte and GFK, which is a global research. Uh, looking on the left, uh, saying that you know the kids, I call those kids, you know, <laughs> 16 to 34, right? They are occasionally and frequently doing other stuff along with their television. And on the right, it's showing what they're doing is they're browsing the internet for information. So they're not actually engaging in the, in the, in the program quite yet or participating or actually talking about it. They're doing other stuff in parallel, you know, the evil multitasking, you could say, right? But that is going to change. I think the participation in the show and the feedback channel is going to explode once we have easier tools right now. It's still a little bit on geek territory. 
Uh, next one is a little bit convoluted, but uh, it's worth for the message. Uh, the cord cutting is what this research says, also from Ericsson Consumer Lab, saying that cord cutting is somewhat happening, but it's not big yet. It's not really on decline uh, on, on a global level in a serious way. Um, if you're looking at the reasons for reducing the spending on the right, the blue box, right, it says respondents saying that they have reduced or eliminated te television. There, there are quite a few, but the box right underneath says that they have increased television subscription, <laughs> right? And on the left, the green box that gives the reasons to stay, right? Live television, easy background viewing habits, basically. Right? So my view on this is that it's not really that strong yet, but it will definitely accelerate. And again, the lack of the suitable over-the-top ecosystem is very temporary. So, guys, you know, if you if you if you're in the TV business, you've got some uh, time to get ready for this. At least in the developing countries, not in, uh, in the developed countries, not in the emerging countries, which I'll show you here in the next slide. Right? Uh, same for mobile TV. Mobile TV is taken off, but really mostly only where there are few alternatives. For example, in Indonesia, you can't get on the internet at home because there's no cable, so you use a mobile. Uh, and that's where television takes off, right? And, and this is, you know, if you look at mobile phone subscriptions in China, India, look at the explosion there that suggested that I think mobile TV is going to be huge, but mostly in those places where we don't have uh, devices that are well connected otherwise. Um, uh, including there's several barriers there, like uh, battery Gerd. life. And, yeah, I'm still here. Good. There's a sort of an yeah. There's a, there's an interesting question, uh, which is um, people are currently have a choke. You know, there's a chokehold that the cable companies have on us because they are delivering internet to our our, our houses as well as television. Um, and so there's this. You know, they give you the triple play package here in the U.S. and people get their landline if they still have that. And uh, their television and their internet connectivity is a discount if you get all of it from the one service. Um, there's a potential breakthrough here where sometime in the not too distant future, you can imagine a 5G, um, you know, connectivity through your cell phone or your mobile device or all your mobile devices. Um, if it really had the bandwidth that could supply it, people would be able to jump away from having cable to the house um, for internet, and as a result. If they had that defection, the whole bundling of stuff together might fail, and it's another thing that might lead to the you know end of the, the sort of monopoly uh, that we have uh, based on you know cable here in the states. Of course, there are, there are huge the huge global differences here, but by and large, you know, the telecoms and ISPs and mobile operators are the ones that have all of the advantages here because basically they can bundle because they're already getting money from people. And as I've been saying for a long time, they just don't have the balls right now to make a move. Right. Right? <laughs> but but they will. You know, they have no choice because if they don't get into this and they start bundling content into mobile, they, they will eventually down compete down to zero. Right, so uh, telemedia is inevitable, in my view. It will probably not happen in the United States first, because for several reasons, including legislation. But uh, next point is uh, a bunch of snippets here. And I think the most important is on the right uh, from TechCrunch and also from GFK and, and the Ericsson study again, is uh, that social and smart television will be led by emerging markets. Because again, they don't have much of an alternative. Right? I mean, look at China. Right? China is the leader in smart television. South Korea, India, you wouldn't have thought that of, of a nation where there's lots of people living on the street, like in Brazil, there's 40 million people starving, right? But yet they're the leader in smart television uh, and using this stuff. So a disruption is going to come from those places, from emerging countries, and we're going to learn from them how that works. Uh, this will should be quite interesting. You know, again, we're, we're saturated, we're over-legislated. Uh, we have, in America, we have more lobbyists than, than senators. I think there's about 2,000 lobbyists lobbying for internet restrictions in the US. So, uh, you know, that is emerging market turf. Um, two more slides and then we'll go to the discussion. As I said earlier, I think the future of paid content, that question came up earlier, is about pay will, not pay wall, taking consumers from prisoners, which we are currently prisoners of iTunes. I'm a happy prisoner, but regardless, I'm still a prisoner, uh, to participants. Uh, and this is going to be whoever nails that down and who gets the support of the rights owners. <laughs> that's the critical question, right? That is the mantra for the future there. Uh, Kevin Kelly said, this is a summary. You may want to download this when you get the link tomorrow. Uh, it's the new generatives of television. There are so many that if I was in the television business, I would have a very positive outlook on the future. 
but embracing those new generatives is a whole different cup of tea that isn't really tied to the old business models. So packaging and interfaces, curation, social context, serendipity, discovering stuff, personal revenants. I mean, this, this goes on forever. Uh, just Google Kevin Kelly and new generatives. And you'll find stuff that I mostly wrote. Just kidding. Now you find his stuff as well. But uh, he has a great video there on YouTube about this topic. Okay. Thanks very much for this. Uh, and uh, before I forget it and we go back to the discussion, I do want to put in a short pitch. Yes, Gerd and Stowe offer workshops and seminars. If you're up for it, you can certainly ask us. <laughs> okay. Let's go back here to the uh, to the uh, initial panel here. Okay. We have some questions. Which one should we take first? Sorry, I don't want to make you dizzy. Just go back to the thing here. Okay, all right. We have some question from uh, Jamal Reigns here. What do you think needs to happen to the telecom infrastructure for connectivity to the cloud by the cloud to become a more significant reality, mainly in the USA? That's a very good question. You know, of course, that America is shamefully behind in terms of the speed of the network. Uh, and that's hopefully being addressed with the broadband initiative, I think. But right now, is everything is, uh, is placed second fiddle to the election process. <laughs> so I don't know. What's your view on that, uh, Stowe? Well, it's it's exactly what you said. Uh, the United States has you know, got a relatively, you know, compared to other advanced economies, we have a relatively slow internet here. Um, uh, my hope is that it'll be, you know, some, some, you know, end run will, will happen. Amazon will decide to go to 5G on, on its WhisperNet service and, and in, with the intention of end running the cable companies and all of a sudden we'll have a gigabit to your, to whatever mobile device you have that you, you know, going to attach to their WhisperNet service. Um, right now, WhisperNet is just the thing that they have in their Kindles to, you know, allow you to browse the web or whatever. But it's that kind of a breakthrough that we need here in the States because, you know, they have very little incentive to invest the money to build out. I mean, Verizon Fios, for example, which is fiber optic to the house, you know, they've definitely made a, a deal, um, you know, basically not to really build it out very much. They're not, they're not interested in spending the money of, of putting all this uh, infrastructure in the ground so we can have high speed internet, uh, aside from where they did. Instead, they decided to make a, a deal with the existing cable operators. And so, you know, nobody's right now got a, a very much of an incentive to do much. I think the biggest opportunities are strange public-private partnerships. You know, the idea of that municipalities might decide it's a, a good thing to have high-speed internet um, in order to attract, um, you know, industry or innovative companies to be there, and they build it themselves. And they just say, well, we, we we're going to take it away from the cable companies. We're going to build it in like we like we own the electric company or whatever. Um, I know the water in you know in in the city, so I think those kinds of things would be the kind of challenge that we would need in America to get get this out of the hands of the people that have very little incentives to speed it up. Well, I, I think you know my my view is that we're going to see a lot more disruption from Google, for example, putting out more Google Fiber because Google is being impatient about that not being good enough. We're going to yeah. see a competition by the likes of Huawei, you know, who currently is more or less blocked of doing business in the U.S. because they're from China. But we're, we're going to see a lot of these things. And of course, one thing is that it's just like uh, you know you have so many people lobbying for uh, the freedom to carry fifty guns in your backpack in in, in Washington uh, that you have the same problem. Here. Here, you know, you have lobbyists who lobby for that stuff to be better for them, but not for the public. Uh, and, and, you know, if you watch Larry Lessig talking about what's happening with corruption in Washington, uh, then, you know, you can only pull out your hair. But I think some of those things are uh, related to those issues. Other ones are basically like what happened here in Switzerland. People just refused to buy the deal unless it was better. And just three months ago, Swisscom, for the first time ever, caved in and offered a flat rate because people weren't buying anymore. So you sort of vote with your wallet there. Right? Um, well, I think we'll have some, we'll have some of the, that pressure here. As I say, there's a, a point of disruption where the economics of the existing system start to not work because people start defecting. And you, you talked earlier about cord cutting, but the biggest threat in the United States is the cord nevers, the kids that just have never paid a cable bill and just aren't going to. Yeah, um, you know, that's, have, that, that's an definitely going to increase. And they'll just <laughs> they'll unrun everything. They'll use all these you know live streaming services. I mean, that generation of kids just doesn't want to buy anything. They don't want to buy cars. They don't want to buy clothes. Um, and uh, you know, they're not going to pay for television. So uh, at least not the way it's configured, or for the reasons that K 
cable, existing cable and TV production companies think that they should. Yeah, I mean, you, you only have to take a look towards Asia to see how this is playing out, right? I mean, the most popular site in, in Indonesia for, for television and for music is Foreshared, which is essentially a, a pirate up and download site. In Russia, it's, it's uh, what is it, um, the Friends Network... Um, um, v contacte, right? It's where you can get all the TV shows and stuff, right? I mean, basically, to look at the future of content and especially television, you know, if we look towards Asia and some of the uh, emerging countries in India and Brazil and Africa and, 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 and Nigeria, and you know, we're going to see that happening there first because clearly the need is there, right? Uh, another question here from Patricia Maltz um, you know, who's going to own the customer? She's asking the conversations with various telcos. They want to be the gatekeeper and get a lion's share of revenues. Well, my, my quick take on that is uh, basically we're moving to the end of this idea of that, that because you can, then you will dominate and you'll just keep your finger on it. It just won't work anymore because it's, well, it's, yeah. too, you know, it's, it's, it's an ecosystem now, right? I mean, basically very much like, you know, one of my new projects is a book called from ego to eco and, and it's, um, uh, it talks about this, you know, how we have to move to to a networked approach. Uh, to me, the telcos have been sitting on their money and shuffling three hundred million dollars worth of SMS into their bank accounts every single day. Uh, th that's going to end. SMS will eventually end, or more or less, not grow. Right, and, and they're going to have to get with the program. And this is one of the things I think that's going to be a deep change. Well, the big, the the fundamental social answer to that question is. You know, the question, once again, is who's going to own the, the customers? Um, in a fully socialized model, the customer owns themselves. You know, they, they make in, in light, you know, their, their choices for what they want to do, and all of the reasonable alternatives are available. You know, it's an open marketplace, and, and so things will not be dominated by cartelish behavior or collusion in a marketplace like a cartel. Instead, it'll be open, and then things find their value and price based on you know supply and demand. Um, we're swi we're switching s clearly to a user centric model instead of content centric model, and you know it, the the reality is it's very threatening to the established players because you know they don't understand how it's going to work. I mean, if uh, the, on the if other you... hand, it's, it's, it may actually be just as good for them. If you jump far enough ahead into the future, but they to jump far enough ahead into the future, they would be so reconfigured they wouldn't actually seem like the same companies anymore. Well, if you look at what's happening right now, is it's quite clearly that that we're going from this idea of owning or controlling the customer to sort of earning their trust, right? And and this is what companies like Facebook and Twitter set out to do. Whether they can do it is a different question. I mean, look at Facebook, for example. Clearly, Facebook has refused a, a lot of advertising that's completely disruptive. This is why GM left, by the way, uh, because they wanted to have really disruptive ads, right? And Facebook has the user experience in mind, and now the stock market is punishing them for this change of paradigm, in my view, is a punishment for because Facebook is the poster child for that new idea of earning trust rather than locking people up even though they they have tried that as well but now we can see i think that this this paradigm shift to owning the customer to earning their trust is basically everywhere uh and, and I, just, this is, I just wouldn't hold facebook up as an exemplar of trust building no 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 absolutely not <laughs> this is this is the only way forward for them right this is the this is the biggest problem that Facebook has. If if they are successful at keeping my trust and earning it and giving something back, then their stock is going to go through the roof. They'll be very successful, right? Well, but they have the same demographic problems that the, the people we're talking about now is you know the the fastest growing, you know, tranche on Facebook nowadays is the fifty five and older crowd. Yeah. Or you know, people trying to do things in in, in distant lands, but um, you know, Facebook hasn't figured out how to capitalize. On what it has, as you know, a being a platform with you know hundreds of millions of people going there every day, and and perhaps worse, they're starting to see a defection of the younger folks who f now think of Facebook as being less interesting than it was a few years ago. And, you know, you're seeing, you know, that's that's a significant problem for them because if they're no longer hip, then they could they could lose it. They could lose you know their advantages very quickly.
Yeah, but I, I think that, you know, that is is a very cruel reality for Facebook now. You know, if they go down to $15 or so, this is pretty much where they should be in my point of view. But, you know, this doesn't mean that their model is, is not realistic. It just has never been done before, right? They, they have to invent all that stuff. Uh, and it, it's this is really sort of the cruel reality. But let's not talk about Facebook too much. There's a question here from, from Gerhard uh, Rettenegger um, about the program's like news that need the attention of the audience, what is the future of news in television? That's a tremendously interesting question. Um, I think I think you know we're we're in such a strange world right now with the nature of what news means relative to entertainment. I mean, it's it's almost you know some of these networks. It's impossible to say that they're actually news networks. They're they're you know. They're propaganda machines or whatever, so it's very odd. Um, but leaving the you know sort of political dimension of it aside, we're at a time when things could change dr very dramatically in that space. So that, uh, for example, news or reporting on activities of things that are going on, you know, now or today or in the last five hours, um, that's really been savaged by things like Twitter and Facebook to a lesser extent. Um, as the place where things seem to break, uh, the news breaks, you know, that, that, that famous weekend where, uh, you know, the Arab Spring was starting to break out and uh, CNN was playing like reruns. They were playing old footage of, you know, some sporting event. And they would completely miss this thing as it was breaking. So it's clear that the combination of, you know, new social tools and the, the is is a, in a, in a collision or is is undermining in a sense sort of conventional news reporting and that's you know no no kind of brilliant insight but the the notion of who is it that is going to most quickly most adroitly take advantage of things like uh, you know social sentiment analysis for what's going on in the, uh, the the world right now and reporting on that right now is a fascinatingly interesting thing and really hasn't been done very well at all Right, and I think that uh, the, the news thing is uh, quite clearly the the, con the conversions of web and of the web and television and mobile. That's the future of news, and and, and you know the only reason that I watch CNN sometimes is because they use Twitter. <laughs> Otherwise, I prefer Al Jazeera right? <laughs> because they already they already doing that. Right, so web, television, mobile conversion that that's the key. The other thing is of course curation because yes, I can get the news on Twitter, but the curation uh, is tough. I mean, I have to know how to do that, right? Um, right? I think this is where news television has a huge opportunity to be real-time, to be social, to be connected, to have a flat hierarchy, but with great expertship. I mean, there's nothing worse than having this huge pipeline of 50,000 opinions raining down on you when it's about an important real-time event, right? But right. Uh, Yeah, cura curation is certainly a, a very hot area and has... You know, it's it's attractive to me conceptually to imagine that I would tune into some show, maybe from Al Jazeera, for example, which is one of the few things I have on my iPhone, and I would be getting like, uh, here are the five video clips about things happen today that you really want to watch while you're standing in line at the bank, right? Mm -hmm. And that that kind of capability is is something that is, you know, my in the print world of print journalism. I've come to rely deeply on people that are those kinds of curators. You know, here's the Atlantic Wire's five things you have to read today. I read that religiously every day. But the equivalent thing in television content just really hasn't happened yet. And it's because television thinks of itself um, as producing new original stuff, and they, and they don't think enough about the notion of it being a curatorial, potentially a curatorial medium. Well, they, they think of themselves as being the center of what they do, right? So, so yeah, rather than being, uh, you know, the, the platform of where it happens. Right? Yep. So I think this is the biggest thing. Anyway, uh, we've got to head towards the end here. We're going to do a short poll. Don't sign off quite yet. There is a very cool poll here. Uh, and, uh, whoop, let me see. Uh, okay, you Poll results. That's great. Okay, the poll is closed. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay. Uh, well, I, I pulled it too early, so you can't say anything. You could, you could just take a look at my answer. You know, will we watch most of our TV over the top is what I've asked, and then uh, I had various answers. But you can't vote anymore because I messed it up. 
too early. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, we'll know better about this next time. Okay, we're going to put this stuff up on YouTube. Um, again, my my uh, web address, mediafuturist.com, and also, as of late, gertfuturist.com. I'm on YouTube and Gillian Hart on, on Twitter, and Stowe is uh, uh, worktalk.ly, right? Yep. Okay, and of course, we are both uh, members and participants in the Futures Agency, uh, which is a global outfit for doing stuff, uh, workshops, seminars, and uh, speeches, and think tanks, and all that stuff. So you can uh, gladly at any time give us all your money, and we'll give us all, we'll give you all our knowledge if that can be arranged. Thanks very much for being part of this. Anything else, anyone? Uh, anyone want to take the microphone or no? I think uh, you know we're we're dwindling down here. There's a big thank you, yes, thank you as well, and uh, we hope to do more of this in the future. So uh, check out your email. Okay, in the next couple of days, you'll get the results of this thing. Thanks very much, though, also for for being part of this. And uh, yeah, we we could talk for the next twenty hours. You know, not that we could convert that much video in one place but um really appreciate all of you dialing in and uh please spread the word and uh we'll talk to you down the road thanks very much